Okay, thank you, Megan. Uh, so I have spent my entire career for the most part at, at North Carolina State University and I spent a lot of that time working on the balsam lily adelgid attacking Fraser fir. And uh, I know virtually nothing about subalpine fir. And so what I'll do is I will talk to you about the, the biology of the insect and a little bit about the work we've done on host insect interactions on many different fur species, all, none of which were subalpine fur. So uh, when I'm done, I'll turn it over to uh, Steve to tell you a little bit about uh, the subalpine fur story. Okay. So why? So you might, it's, it, you might just have to run your mouse over, click on that, and not try again. Sometimes it just has to wake up. There we go. There you go. Okay, so this diagram uh, shows the life stages that you will never see in the field uh, because uh, it's eliminated the woolly mass that you will usually see. But it includes the, uh, the egg, the crawler stage, which is the only mobile form of the insect, uh, the, the larval stage as it's beginning to uh, excrete the uh, wool that will eventually cover the entire body. And this is the adult with her stylet that extends into the uh, cortical tissue. Uh, and this is what you will likely see in the field. This is on Fraser fur. This uh, whitewash look is uh, caused by the Balsamolia adelgid. And uh, the adelgid will attack any part of the tree. This happens to be on the trunk of the tree. And when it's on the trunk of the tree, that's when it, when it is its most lethal. Uh, uh, up in the crown of the tree, uh, the tree can generally survive a little longer, but uh, when it hits the uh, trunk of the tree, uh, the tree usually dies within a few years. Uh, and this is what we saw in the 60s and 70s uh, in the southern Appalachians, uh, mainly uh, white ghosts, dead snags of Fraser fir. Uh, about 90 to 95 percent of all mature Fraser fir were killed by the adelgid. Uh, so the adelgid itself is a very small insect. It's only a millimeter in length. It's parthenogenic. Only females exist in this country. And uh, uh, it reproduces asexually. It has at least two generations per year. If the weather is warm enough or it's low enough in elevation, there may be a third generation. At least in our part of the world, there's only the egg production per female has only been around 30 to 50 eggs per female although the literature uh, has numbers that are much higher than that. I mentioned there are three life stages, the egg, larvae, and the adult, uh, and, and, that, and that the insect uh, secretes this waxy substance that covers the entire insect that you see here, uh, and that uh, prevents the insect from desiccating. Uh, the crawler is the only mob modal stage and it is uh, passively dispersed either by wind, birds, or mammals. Uh, they, they do not fly. And so uh, frequently the biggest trees are the ones that intercept the most adelgids and, and get infested first. The crawlers respond to various stimuli as they're crawling around and they eventually find uh, a feeding spot and insert their stylets. And at that point, they no longer move any further. Uh, the feeding site usually, uh, there's usually a stimulation on the host that creates uh, a bit of a uh, uh, callus area, or, and so you've got a bit of a crevice effect, and that's where they like to feed in, in confined areas like crevices. Uh, the feeding sites are chosen for their accessibility to the parenchyma cells. The silates are inserted through the epidermis and into the cortex where they feed on cortical uh, parenchyma. And if you were to uh, look closely, this happens to be uh, on the branch where you see the needles and uh, the uh, woolly mass has been teased apart and you see uh, lots of eggs in there. And off to the side here, you see a few uh, early instars that have already inserted their stylets and are beginning to produce that woolly mass for, from, for the next generation. The dark mass you see here, you don't see much of it, but you see a little bit of it, and that's, that's the adult. The crawlers look very much like the eggs, except they have legs. 
So most of the uh, Fraser fir in uh, in the world, most of the native Fraser fir in the world are located in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. 75% of it is located in Great Smoky Mountain National Park, and then it goes all the way up to Mount Rogers in Virginia. Uh, as, as I mentioned, about 90% of the uh, fur were killed, of the mature fur were killed by the adelgid. However, regeneration was good. Uh, I remember when I worked uh, in the 70s on this, I would be walking on literally a carpet of seedlings of Fraser fir. So regeneration was very good for whatever reason in the, in the natural stands, uh, the adelgia did not uh, uh, attack the young trees. And so the result of that was what you see in this picture here. This first picture is a picture of Mount Craig from Mount Mitchell. Mount Mitchell was the first uh, area in the uh, Appalachians that, uh, that had uh, the insect or that were discovered in, uh, on, uh, on Fraser fir. And that happened in about the 60s, mid 60s. And so in 50, in 56, this presumably was before the Adelgid attack and everything looks nice and green. 68 was a couple of years after and you can see the ridge top where you have a lot of dead snags. 78 and 70s in general is when the mountain looked its worst. Uh, lots and lots of dead snags. They still exist today because they deteriorate very slowly. Uh, in 88, it begins to uh, green up again. Yeah, in 98, again, a little greener. 2000 in line, it looks pretty good. It looks like it did back in 56. And now I got to add, I got to go back up there in 2018 and add one more photo to the picture. But it, uh, they have recovered. And so now the question is, what's going to happen in the future? Is the adelgid going to come back? Is the adelgid still in the area. Will it come back and do the same kind of destruction? Is there some kind of evolution going on? And, and maybe some of the trees will survive this and we'll have some element of resistance. Uh, only time will tell. Uh, at least in North Carolina, Fraser fir uh, is an important commercial species uh, because of the Christmas tree industry. Uh, Christmas trees are big in North Carolina. Uh, only Oregon grows more Christmas trees than North Carolina does, and North Carolina is a close second. So it's a big industry, and that's where we got a lot of our financial support to work on balsam of the And obviously, uh, they spend a lot of money uh, attempting to control uh, the adelgid. Not because they worry about uh, the trees dying, uh, it, it, they worry about the appearance of the tree. And so there are uh, some typical reactions to the adelgid. Uh, on susceptible firs. The first is this gouting on the twigs. Obviously a Christmas tree is not going to look very good if it has that. And then I mentioned earlier that there's this uh, callus tissue that forms at the uh, feeding sites. There you see the white masses and a little bit of callus underneath, underneath each one of them. And so those, that's callus or tumors. And then I guess probably the worst thing that happens in Christmas trees is this flat top appearance. Uh, and that happens very quickly. They're very sensitive to, to that. And this is a, you know, in a natural stand, but in Christmas tree plantations, you see that almost immediately. And that's what they, when they survey for the adelgia, that's actually what they're looking for is that flat top tree. And a lot of times they'll find that tree and, th and then they go to the tree and they have to look and look and look before they finally find the adelgia. It just takes a very light infestation uh, for the tree to lose, to lose its apical dominance loss of ap apical dominance. And the thing that finally really kills a tree, the mature trees especially, is the formation of road holts or red wood, this dark reddish colored wood. It's very dense and it does not translocate fluids. So the tree is basically in a state of physiological drought. And, and after a year or two of that, uh, the trees die. <clears throat> now there are fur species in the world that have uh, some degree of resistance to it, or are at least tolerant of it. Uh, most su susceptible trees are Fraser fir and subalpine fir, uh, and, and also balsam fir and Canadian fir. <clears throat> uh, moderately resistant car uh, Korean fir, noble fir, European silver fir. <coughs> Excuse me. And then resistant uh, fir include uh, vetch fir and momi fir. We happen to have a 
where we had a plantation of vetch fir uh, that a Christmas tree grower, grower planted many years ago that was right next to a Fraser fir stand. And uh, he thought he could make Christmas trees out of them. And they looked pretty good, except he couldn't get the, the terminals to cooperate. He always had multiple terminals, so he gave up on the project. Uh, this is what the Fraser fir looked like right nearby. You can see they were heavily infested. And this is what we found on vetch fir. One or two tiny little adelgids. Uh, we found the adult underneath them, but nothing else. No eggs or, or uh, larvae or no uh, uh, crawlers or anything like that. So it looked like vetch fir was really truly resistant. So host responses or the factors that may aid in uh, BWA resistance include thickness to the outer bark, texture of the bark, formation of secondary periderm around the, uh, the stylet sites, the, the production of thicker outer, outer bark in essence, uh, the production of secondary chemicals uh, such as jubabiome and jubabiome-like compounds which may render the insect uh, uh, sterile or at least reduce the number of eggs that are produced. And then increased production of resin occurs and drought tolerance may also be a factor. Among and within all species of fur in North America, some trees can tolerate and recover from the indulgent attack if, if they are uh, perhaps sprayed with insecticide. So the leaders are replaced, the normal wood is formed, and the tree goes on to live a normal life. So uh, what we did in one of our studies, uh, and this may be uh, something that uh, folks that are working on subalpine fur would consider something along these lines as well. We screened for resistance across, in our case, multiple fur species. These were fur species that had some potential for turning into Christmas trees. We uh, picked uh, seedlings of equal age. They were grown under the same conditions and they were infested with BWA collected at one time from a single, serve, single source. And then we observed the response of both the host and the insect. And so of the 12 fur species, uh, we selected seven, and unfortunately subalpine fur was not one of them. Uh, we did include uh, European silver fur and uh, concolor fur, white fur, which are moderately resistant. And we had the two, it's not on my slide here, but we also had momi fur and vetch fur. <clears throat> and what we did was uh, we, uh, put the seedlings in this kind of an arrangement and uh, collected fra infested Fraser fur from nearby, from a nearby stand, brought them over and laid them on top of the seedlings in this manner. And then allowed the uh, crawlers to drop down onto the seedlings. And we call this the rain down technique. And uh, we just let it go and followed it through time. And so we had, as I mentioned, there were adelgids virtually in all parts of the tree, but they preferred uh, the branches. And so rather than throwing a lot of data at you, I thought I, I, I'd select the data that seemed most pertinent uh, so that you could look at that. So this is all mainly branch data where we found the most adelgids to begin with. And we have uh, the yellow represents tolerant trees, brown susceptible trees, green <coughs> resistant trees, and then the gray were unknown trees. And so the, this first slide is uh, the mean number of settled instars per branch and the tolerant trees look pretty good. The resistant trees, they were okay too. Uh, Turkish fir looked pretty good. Korean fir, uh, you know, it was in the uh, susceptible stage, but it was one of the least susceptible of the susceptible ones. And then all the Fraser fir were over towards the left. So when we looked at the number of adults, those that matured to adult stage, a Turkish fir still looked very good. Korean fir is becoming a bit of a surprise. It continues to look good. And then uh, the other surprise is that European silver fir is beginning to look not so good. And the resistant trees are kind of right in the middle of, of, uh, of the story here. 
And now we're looking at eggs per branch, per centimeter of branch. Korean fir is still looking good. So is Turkish fir. Uh, silver fir, surprisingly, is not looking that great. Remember, these are all seedlings, so the story may change as the trees mature. Momi and, and vetch are still looking reasonable. And then we have the number of eggs per female, and our Korean fir uh, is still on the right-hand side, and this is you know, a bit of a surprise. Turkish fir is in the middle of the pack, and then European silver fir is way over to the left, so that's, that's a real surprise. We thought that European silver fir would look better than that. And then finally, and this is maybe the most interesting thing, is that uh, the, this is the proportion of trees exhibiting gouting. And maybe this is the, the, the measure that is going to be most significant in analyzing resistance. But all of the trees that, according to the literature, are susceptible uh, fell to the left of the graph, except for Korean fir. That's still over here on the right. And then uh, the resistant trees, Vetchamomi look good, and the silver and white fir still look good as well. So, you know, this is just one test, but it's, it's, it says something, and uh, maybe uh, additional work, well, additional work for us is definitely needed, and maybe this is something that uh, folks working on subalpine fir uh, could look at as well. So our conclusions were that uh, the crawlers appear to be preferentially settling at the base of the buds. There was no species differences there. The species responses <clears throat> generally fell within the expectations of uh, resistant classifications. <clears throat> Susceptible species ranked higher than tolerant or resistant species, and the few exceptions that we had was a European silver fir ranked higher than expected. Uh, and maybe this is only because we were dealing with seedling, seedling classes, not mature trees. But Korean fir ranked lower than expected. They were more resistant in the seedling stage. Uh, Turkish fir appears to be somewhat resistant and the Trojan fir highly susceptible. Uh, but there was no differences in the gouting. The gouting responses were observed more often in susceptible species than resistant or tolerant species. The reason why we, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, the reason why we were able to work with all these different species is because uh, the forest genetic, uh, the Christmas tree genetics program run by John Frampton had literally gone all over the world looking for these species and uh, he made them available to us. And he was <clears throat> interested in finding trees that had resistance not only to balsam woolly adelgid but also to another invasive problem on Fraser fir and that is Phytophthora root rot, which is actually worse than uh, the balsam woolly adelgid. And what John hopes to accomplish in time is a tree that is resistant to both of them. I gotta get a drink of water. Okay, so what we need to continue doing is to continue the survey for trees throughout the world that have survived the BWA and then to select these trees and get their offsprings and test them for uh, resistance. And it would be very helpful for us if we could understand the biological basis for resistance rather than having to rely on uh, infesting, exposing them to adelgids. The problem with that is you're, you're dealing with two different biological systems. And uh, so there's, ver there's more variables in there than I would like to have. If we, if we could have some kind of a, per a parameter that measures or that tells us the mechanism of resistance that we could look at and measure it, that would be much more, that would be much more useful for us than relying on the adelgids themselves because the quality of adelgids varies widely. From an old infestation, the quality is usually very poor from the young infestation, it's usually much better. And so you're dealing with that variable as well, which is, would be nice if we could eliminate that. Uh, and we're also, uh, we're not doing it. Uh, John Frampton's uh, Christmas tree uh, genetics program is doing it. They're looking at hybrids. As I mentioned, he wants to find trees that have resistance to both the you know, adelgid and phytophthora root rot. One of the things that John did was he went into the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. I mentioned that 75% of all the native Fraser fir are in this park, and there were survivor trees in this park. Uh, this was done um, in the uh, 90s. So he collected trees from, uh, from 
from these areas where the trees were still alive and uh, he took cuttings from those from those trees. So they survived the adelgids. Everything around them was killed, but these have survived. And then he took them and put them into a seed orchard uh, and that seed orchard has matured and we now have the offspring of these trees that we are now in the process of testing by doing the rain down technique and uh, exposing them to the adelgid. So the story continues. I don't have the uh, results of that yet. We're still evaluating that, but uh, you know, work continues on this project. And maybe this is the kind of thing that uh, would work on subalpine fur as well. Speaking of which, Steve, I am done. And unless there are some questions, I will turn it over to Steve. Um, you know, there are a couple questions, but maybe we should just let Steve get started and we can attack those at the end. There were a couple of questions that came in while Fred was talking. And yeah, go ahead, go, go for it if you want to address one of the One of the questions uh, specifically asked about balsam woolly adelgid attacking spruce. Uh, every member that I know of in this genus, Adelgis, does have spruce as an ancestral host, but balsam woolly adelgid does not switch hosts between spruce and fir, like some of our common native species, like coolie spruce, gall adelgid, and some of those. So to my knowledge, and Fred can correct me, there is no uh, switching, and there's no balsam woolly adelgid on spruce at all. One of the other questions that came in, um, asked about, well, I'll have to get to it, uh, and I'll just start with my presentation. So, okay, subalpine fur. It's the most widely distributed true fur in North America. Um, it has a huge range, unlike Fraser fur, and I'm fairly familiar with Fraser fur from working with Fred uh, back east. Subalpine fur occurs primarily in mountainous regions here in the west. Um, to me, it is the mountains. I backpack a fair amount with one of my daughters, and I know that I've, I've reached a certain elevation when I start seeing subalpine fir and then go through the subalpine fir zone into white bark pine. To me, it, it, is, it is the mountains in Western North America. It frequently co-occurs with species like white bark, and Engelmann spruce, and I'll talk a little bit about white bark later because white bark, we're, we're losing it as a high elevation species because of, of other pests. Like um, most true firs, it's shade tolerant, can establish on trees, on uh, uh, disturbed sites, and it has high restoration value for us in these higher elevation forests. Like I said, to me, subalpine fir is the mountains. I backpack into some of these lakes and you see what to me is a majestic tree standing there and the aroma is absolutely wonderful. It's not much of a timber species for us and I think that is why it doesn't get some of the attention that say uh, um, some of the other uh, western conifers get. It's not a major Christmas tree for us. We grow Fraser fir out here for Christmas trees and concolor fir and multiple other species, but it's not a, a dominant Christmas tree species. The wood is soft, odorless, um, great pulping tree. It can be used for poles, but it does require preservatives. And Fred was talking about Phytophthora root rot uh, subalpine fir is just a typical fir to me. It suffers from a lot of pest problems. We have a lot of pathogens that attack it and a lot of other insects that attack it. It disperses. It has large winged seeds dispersed primarily by wind, um, but it, it can be uh, cached, which I'll get to in the next slide. The seeds travel primarily in the direction of the prevailing winds, and we've done some dispersal work looking at the adelgid, but it's pretty similar for the trees, just not quite as far. The seeds are dispersed into clear cuts, but it's not a, a long distance dispersal by any stretch. Uh, 30 meters is what we're looking at. Uh, into a clear cut, maybe as much as 80 meters. I've heard some people say up to 100 meters, but that's a long way for these seeds to go. Squirrels disperse some of the seeds and 
you heard Fred talk about these thick carpets of Fraser fir seedlings. We see the exact same thing with subalpin, and a lot of those are coming up from uh, squirrel middens where you have cached cones where the seeds all germinate really close to one another, and you end up with almost a carpet of subalpin fir seedlings occurring on sites. Uh, subalpin fir zones are great summer range. Elk, moose, woodland caribou a little further north. Um, they're not very good winter range because it is where we have harsh winter conditions. The seeds are large. Uh, they frequently uh, are up to 26% of a cone's weight, which is huge. They are consumed by small mammals and Clark's nuthatch, which is typically associated with white bark pine, actually will take these seeds and cache them when uh, white bark is, is not available or no longer available in a site. Like I said, it has a lot of very common native pests. If you look at it, um, it's very susceptible to spruce budworm, western balsam bark beetle, Douglas fir tussock moth, fur engraver. It uh, suffers, our, our major pathogen appears to be a gnosis root rot, but it's susceptible to a lot of root rots. Um, it's just, to me, like I said, a typical true fir in the West. This is, I apologize, this is a little fuzzy. Um, as the screen says, I borrowed this slide from, from a, a Forest Service fiddle, but I think it gives a good representation of where the insect occurs. If you look, Fred was talking about Fraser fir down here in Virginia and North Carolina. A lot of this up here is gonna be balsam fir. Out here in the west, what you see in the interior is frequently in subalpine fir with a lot on the coast being coastal grand fir. We have not done the resistance studies out here that have been done in the east with Fraser fir. But we do know that if you look in this area, grand fir, which was the predominant host over here on the coast, is not hit as hard, especially as you get down into these lower zones. We think it's because of hybridization. Um, Todd Ott, who was a PhD student, looked at um, hybridiz or looked at the genetics of grand fir on a, a north-south um, uh, line, and there appears to have been a lot of, of uh, uh, interbreeding of species during the last ice age. And as the, the ice moved back north and we got some separation, our grand fur genetics is different from the jam grand fur genetics on the west coast. And that is something we would like to look at. If you look uh, within Idaho, which is what I'm most familiar with, we had our initial populations of, of uh, balsam woolly adelgid occurring in the northern part of the state and then moving south and east through time. What we have done is set up uh, 40 sites throughout subalpine fur zones within the state and gone in and surveyed for the adelgid, uh, fairly intensive uh, ground surveys. And the Forest Service has done something fairly similar. If you look at uh, one of my former students, Colleen McCarr, um, put together a, a distribution map through time, starting with the early 1980 infestations, which uh, were right around Moscow, Idaho, where I happen to live. And if you notice through time, they're moving east and they're moving south. And they're following upper elevation sites predominantly but we do get uh, subalpine fur occurring in, in frost pockets, and they're hit very hard in frost pockets. As Fred mentioned, it's temperature dependent with balsam woolly adelgid development, and we have seen uh, subalpine fur completely eliminated from frost pockets in my part of Idaho. Now, the Forest Service, and this is uh, uh, two figures taken from a publication by Laura Lowry, the Forest Service has looked more in the south than most of us were looking for years. And if you look over, you can see that the, the dark 
uh, patches represent balsam woolly adelgid occurrence, light patches uh, represent um, them not being able to find it, and this was from 2006 to 2010. If you come over here, you can see 2010 through 2014, and again, you're starting to see movement more to the south. Now, one thing I did, and I hope this came out okay, don't know how well it's going to be um, visible to all of you on your screens, is I put our uh, work in the north with uh, Laura's maps in the southern part of the state, and you get a pretty distinct movement of the insect moving from the north to the south and from the west to the east. Now, Fred mentioned that dispersal of the insect is uh, predominantly by wind and by uh, mammals, and we're gonna get into that in a minute. We think it's predominantly by wind out here. One of the things that has been getting a bit of attention though is it's an invasive species. And one of our first uh, means of management or first means to try and control a lot of invasives is to use biological control agents. Now, balsam woolly adelgid was no different. There were, I think, 23 total species that were imported and released into the United States um, I know there were more than 20, I think it's 23. Six have become established, um, most not established very well. They're difficult to find and effectiveness remains really in doubt, I put in question. Uh, the ones that have become established are either flies, diptera or beetles, coleoptera, and they're in four families. Coccinellids are your typical ladybird beetles or what most people think of. There are a couple of species that uh, feed on adelgids, feed on balsam woolly adelgid that have become established. Uh, there's the Dariodontid and uh, Laracobius is the genus that has become established. We have a native Laracobius out here, Nigrinus, which I know has been imported to the eastern part of the country and released. Um, we have a Cessidomyid and um, Daryl Ross over at Oregon State and um, uh, Kimberly Wallen have been looking a lot at uh, a different species in the genus Leucopus, but in, in that genus. What Daryl and, and his group, along with Kimberly, uh, have looked at are, as far as the Leucopus, is this Leucopus tapii. There have been very few that I can find um, definitive studies or surveys recovering predators of balsam woolly adelgid uh, in the West. In 1994, Lee Humble up in Canada um, recovered three species that had been released with relative uh, frequency. And just last year, Daryl and his group published a paper mostly concentrating on hemlock woolly adelgid um, predators, but they did look at the uh, predators on balsam woolly adelgid and found these two in relatively high numbers. What we've been doing is looking at what happened in the East back in the uh, 60s and 70s, where we're looking at what's happening in stands as the adelgid comes through. Now, this happens to be uh, data that we actually collected for whitebark pine. And if you look, these sites were all on Caribou Targhee National Forest in the southeastern um, corner of, of Idaho. And if you look at the pine component, white bark pine is in green down here. The mature trees here on the left, you see a lot of white bark in there with subalpine in every one of the stands on those two uh, forests that we, that we surveyed. If you come over here to regeneration, I want you to look at all of this subalpine fur that is there. We're starting to lose, I shouldn't say starting, we're losing white bark pine because of a combination of problems, mountain pine beetle and white pine blister rust. If subalpine fur is the tree that's gonna come in in those high elevations and, and dominate the stands moving forward, then we have to figure out a way to deal with balsam woolly adelgid. Otherwise, we're looking at losing multiple tree species that have incredible ecological significance to us as far as hydrologic properties. Um, the other thing, oh, let me back up for just a second. If you look at, at these, 
and, and see differences. The next thing that I'm going to show is subalpine fur tends to reestablish at our, I'll call them lower sites, um, but the stands that, that you see with a lot of subalpine fir are, are lower than the stands with a lot of white bark pine. So right now there's a elevational component that we think is being compromised and we're starting to collect data to see if it is being compromised based on climate change. As it gets warmer and subalpine fir is capable of moving upslope more, is balsam woolly adelgid going to go with it? If I had to make a prediction, which I don't like to do, I predict that yes, it's going to follow its, its food up north. When we have co-occurring um, mature and regeneration subalpine fur on a stand, notice that as the percentage of mature uh, subalpine fur comes in, and is infested with balsam woolly adelgid, the percentage of fur regeneration that is infested goes up in almost a perfect correlation. So this is work that one of my former students, Kendra Schatzko, uh, was heavily involved with, and this actually worries us. Unlike Fraser fur, where um, Fred mentioned, it can be difficult to find the adelgid on regen, uh, we don't have any trouble at all. And if it's in the overstory, the regeneration just gets hammered. Just a, a quick reminder, these are straight from Fred slides of the adelgid and the gouting. These are the two symptoms that we um, use in our ground surveys of the uh, stands. But we also use satellite imagery and um, we think that in, in the West where we have huge tracts of land that have to be surveyed on a relatively frequent basis. As we move, um, as aerial detection surveys mature, we're seeing more and more um, work being done using satellite imagery. Now I put these up here because a lot of people uh, aren't very familiar with spectral signatures. This is just a, a standard spectral signature of um, vegetation, leaves, and what I want you to pay attention to is this near infrared uh, plateau right here and this, this uh, chlorophyll well right here where if the chlorophyll in leaves is compromised it frequently shows up right here between the green peak and what is called the red edge. If you come over to the right hand side of your screen, uninfested uh, subalpine fur is represented in green and it's that same spectral signature that you see here but notice that out here in the near infrared we see huge differences in what that looks like. Now we can't see uh, in the infrared but most of these spectral sensors can. And the other thing I want you to pay attention to is this area right here in this chlorophyll well. One of the things that, that happens with uh, subalpine fur, as it's infested, is it doesn't, um, the buds don't break nearly as well. Older foliage is what we see when we're looking at uh, spectral imagery and the older foliage tends to be faded and we get this, this change in the um, spectral well, in the water um, capacity, chlorophyll well. What we did then was uh, look to see can we narrow it down from the whatever it was 640 bands that we have in in our radiometer to just looking at a couple of bands now this uh, 670 nanometer band is in the near infrared so that one made a lot of sense to us and again we got very good separation of trees that were infested, which are the red dots, with trees that were not infested, which are the green dots. And this infestation uh, signature starts to show up within two to three years of the infestation. Now, for those of you who are Canadian or who like Canadian television, yes, we named this the Red Green Index, and we did that on purpose. One of my favorite all-time comedies. Um, one of the things that going along that same uh, direction of trying to figure out what is going on at these sites, 
we've gone in and looked at uh, FIA data throughout Idaho. And this is a mess, I know, and I don't want anybody to pay attention to uh, trying to decipher what exactly is going on here, but all of these little dots represent individual FIA sites within the state that have a, a, some component of sub alpine fur present. Now, they may not be in high density, but they're there. The colors represent different uh, sample periods, and one of the problems that we have is in doing the mortality measurements, uh, balsam woolly adelgid was not one of their mortality factors that was listed for quite a while. Laura or Danielle uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but that is now changing, and balsam woolly adelgid is one of the mortality factors being looked at. Looking down into the southeastern corner of the state, uh, what I really want you to pay attention to is we still have a lot of uninfested stands or, or stands showing no mortality, which are the open bars. We do have mortality that ranges from 25% on up to uh, upwards of 75% as you go into some of these stands. And again, this is uh, the southeastern part of the state and we're trying to get more sites in there. I know Laura is looking pretty heavily at some of the sites over there. Uh, Balsam Malia Delgit has now been found in, in Utah. We have found it in uh, uh, the southeastern part of Idaho, so it's moving relatively rapidly across. If you look at our sites and where we've looked over um, where we put our sites in and, and did extensive ground surveys, Another thing we've done is quite a bit of modeling for dispersal um, purposes. Larry Lass, who just recently retired from my uh, department, uh, looked at uh, establishing a map of likelihood of occurrence of subalpine fur in areas across the southern part of the state. And the one problem we have with the map is that the likelihood of occurrence says nothing again about the density that the trees may be there or the age, but it gives us an idea of where uh, subalpine fur occurs on the landscape. Another thing I want to bring up, Fred mentioned that uh, they are, are pretty confident, are very confident in the number of generations and, and the development of the insect in the east. I can't say that we are that confident here especially as we get into higher elevation, especially at the, the low humidity conditions that we have. Um, some of us are starting to think that balsam woolly adelgid can go through, does go through a summer dormancy, uh, estivation, which is very similar to winter diapause for those of you who are um, um, used to, to that term. And it's characterized by an inactivity. When I get calls, from uh, people about balsam woolly adelgid and ask them to go take a look, they'll frequently tell me that the insect looks dead in July, that they think that the population has gone away in early August. And then lo and behold, it's back at the end of September. So we think there may be a summer dormancy uh, for the insect here based on humidity. And the reason that becomes important, this is again from modeling, if you look at the arrows, that's wind direction, and, and uh, velocity, and we did it, we did it on a monthly basis, and if you look July, um, the only thing I'm trying to point out here is if you look at the, the intensity of the winds and the direction of the winds, it changes very, very dramatically from July to August. And when you couple that with, um, we used a seed dispersal model to try and predict where the adelgid would move in different months. And based on wind direction, it changes dramatically in July and August. The hatched regions here represent known populations of the adelgid. And in July, we have much, much more of a southerly movement. And in August, we have a more easterly movement. So if the insect does go through an estivation because of the low, and when I say low humidity, I do mean low humidity. I mean, we're talking 12, 15%. Um, it's very comfortable to work in the mountains then, but the insect may not be able to uh, disperse then. So we need to know when, if, and then when it breaks estivation. 
so that we can get a better feel for how the dispersal will occur um, from, from year to year. So Fred listed uh, a set of needs. I'm gonna do the same thing. We need to improve our detection and identification capabilities here in the West. We use uh, the remotely sensed data and that gives us a pretty good idea. However, Fred mentioned that uh, drought is a problem. We uh, still have difficulty um, differentiating drought stress from balsam woolly adelgid infestations. We need to improve our understanding of the interaction with balsam woolly adelgid and other biotic factors, especially things like anosis root rot and western balsam bark beetle. Western balsam bark beetle uh, is very prevalent in subalpine fir and does not take a huge population in a tree to overcome tree resistance and kill the tree. So if there's an interaction going on there, we need to find out what it is. We need to understand, improve our understanding of the genetic diversity, both of the insect uh, and of its host, subalpine fir. If we look north-south, I mean, the tree occurs from Alaska down into New Mexico. There's, there's got to be genetic adaptations, and I think we need to start uh, a serious um, program of looking at that genetic diversity. We need to understand our, our understand, we need to improve our understanding for the basis of resistance. Fred mentioned this as well. Um, we also need to understand the seasonal life history, history of the insect, and put it um, on an elevational basis with the phenology of its tree host. We need to improve the models of range expansion and dispersal uh, based on, on host type, the species, the genetics of the species, physical parameters, um, temperature and humidity is, is what I think we need to focus on, and geographic diversity, which would be elevation in a lot of the areas. We need to improve our understanding and testing of potential biological control agents. Um, and we need to improve management guidelines that include recommendations or restoration potential. Just for people's, uh, if they want, they can look up some of the literature uh, that I've cited throughout this. And that was where I was ending. So I should probably get out of share screen. Would that be right, Megan? Yes. Yeah, okay. if you could stop sharing your screen and then everybody can turn their cameras on. Um, and I will encourage people to um, use the Q&A windows to put their questions in there. Um, we have two questions that are currently um, live. So everybody unmute yourself so that um, anyone can chime in. And um, Danielle, okay, cool. Everybody's unmuted. So. Does anybody want to tackle the first question from Ron? I'll read the question and then whoever wants to chime in can go for it. So Ron asks, when an insect reproduces asexually, are the offspring genetically identical to the parent? As far as we know, the answer is yes. Uh, there, uh, there have been subspecies of BWA reported. Uh, and I think the situation out west might be different than it is in, in the southern Appalachians. We only had one subspecies, but I think out west there may be more than one. I'm, I'm not sure about the answer to that. Laura might know more than I do. Uh, Nathan Havel back in Connecticut does most of our genetic work. Yeah, so we've been sending all of our collections to Nathan and he is, yeah, looking at the DNA components from everything we're collecting from white fur and alpine fur in Utah. So it seems that is underway and we're still looking at that piece of the puzzle. Yeah, my understanding from Nathan from at least maybe four or five years ago is that we thought there we had the subspecies that's similar to the one down by Fred and Fraser fir system that's more aggressive than seems to be more aggressively killing the trees anyway than the uh, some of the other subspecies and more like um, balsam fir, Newfoundland, and in Northeast. 
on the on the balsam fir. But we, yeah, we have to continue that work and send him continue collections and hopefully tease that out pretty soon. Great. Great. You know, yeah. I probably should have, I probably should have had everybody introduce themselves. So um, would you mind going around? Danielle, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Danielle Molesky. I'm an entomologist here in Ogden. All right, Ryan, are you, I'm not sure if you're with us still. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn your video on. Okay. Go for it. Introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Ryan Davis with Utah State University Extension. I'm an arthropod diagnostician in the plant pest diagnostic lab. Great. And then Laura? Hi, I'm a forest entomologist at the Boise Field Office of Forest Health Protection. And I've been chasing this insect since I moved out here in 2005. <laughs> I think so. It's, um, yeah, the damages are getting worse and, and more severe every year and spreading eastward and southward throughout my service area in Southern Idaho. Great, everybody. So I'm going to launch some polls, which will I'll ask the remaining participants to take um, before you leave the meeting room. And then I'll remind you that you can put your questions in the Q&A window. So please use that opportunity to do so right now. And I'll ask the question that Alexander had. Is the balsam woolly adelgid the primary cause of decline or do they carry a bacterial pathogen that then kills the tree? You want to take that, Fred? Well, I'm not aware of a bacterial infection. Uh, I, I don't know that anybody's ever studied that or come to any conclusions about that. Uh, during uh, my career, there was controversy about what was killing the trees. Uh, there were those who said it was acid rain. And, uh, you know, I don't think we ever resolved that debate. I felt like uh, acid rain might have been a factor that made the trees more susceptible. But, uh, that, you know, that has never been resolved. Uh, acid rain was not nearly as bad in uh, the Southern Appalachian as it was in the 70s and 80s. And as you saw in those photographs, the trees do look healthier. Uh, at the time we're telling you what BWA will do, because uh, the BWA is still there. As far as bacteria is concerned, I'm, 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 I'm unfamiliar with that. So, so um, take, taking the take question, the in, question a in a slightly different, slightly different direction. direction, we, we don't, don't, that I know, that I know of, of uh, find, uh, find bacterial, bacterial or fungal, fungal associates. associates, but, but as I said in my part of the presentation, we would like to uh, know how the adelgid is interacting with other uh, pest species on subalpine fir. I am personally uh, very curious about its interaction with western balsam bark beetle. Uh, Dryocetes, uh, we know, hits these trees. We know can be very damaging in the stands where it occurs. And it would be nice to know if balsam woolly adelgid uh, renders those trees more susceptible to bark beetle attack because I think we're going to see that type of interaction in the future. Uh, it would also be nice, uh, in my presentation I, I briefly mentioned uh, western spruce budworm and Douglas fir tussock moth. Um, one of the questions that keeps coming up uh, for me is do those defoliators make these trees more susceptible to attack by the adelgid? So those are questions that are obviously going to be longer term, but I think it's things that we have to start dealing with. Um, Tim Egan asked, um, has balsam woolly adelgid been found in Montana yet? Or anybody know? Danielle and Lauren, I muted you, so go ahead and unmute yourself if you wanna answer. Yes, um, BWA has been confirmed in Montana as far as I'm, as far as I know. And they're also initiating the permanent plots as, as well as Utah this year to start looking at and monitoring BWA impacts over time. Yeah, they've been, um, they found balsam woody delgid, as far as I know, um, eastward, kind of north of Yellowstone. And so, so they've gone, it's, that's pretty, 
much through much of the host type in Montana um, at different ranges. So we're doing continuing work like Danielle says this summer to describe the damage levels throughout the range in Idaho, Montana, and Utah. And um, we're also working this summer and trying to um, like tie together what the damages mean on the ground when we record them, polygons from aerial survey, which will be pretty helpful to describe um, we, we ha can easily use that tool once the damage gets very easy to see, but we haven't been able to say like how much of the, how many percent, well, what, the, what is the percentage of trees infested and what size classes within those polygons. Um, and just some preliminary work we started this summer. Um, it's pretty hot out, like all of them infested. <laughs> so we're really excited to, to do more of that this fall. Somebody asked about Colorado. Has it been found in Colorado? No. As far as I know, not in Colorado yet. Great. Are there any other questions from our audience? We still have over 100 people present. I see, I see that in the chat, Danielle asked about um, has anyone looked at the role of temperature or climate change on the established BWA biological controls? To my knowledge, we don't have anything that we would call an established biological control agent. We have some things that feed on them, but uh, I, I don't think anybody would go so far as, as to say they're having a huge impact on the adelgid populations. Um, that said, we have done some surveys uh, and where we have multiple adelgid species co-occurring, and this is on multiple tree species, we do get things, some of the skimness that are more associated with native adelgids do move over and, and they'll eat balsam woolly adelgid if it's available. Uh, they don't seem to concentrate on it, but they'll take it. So I don't think there's really an answer for that question, Danielle. Well, I think you guys uh, did a great job today. Thank you so much. Um, Danielle asked another question. One of you guys can take, take that one away. I'm gonna put in the chat window also um, the link to where this webinar is being recorded. So anybody can check it out. It'll be posted in the next couple days. Um, but go ahead, Steve or Fred, go ahead and, and read that question out loud so the audience can hear it. Oh, it wasn't a question. Oh, I'm sorry. It was just a comment that perhaps we need to plan a trip to oh. the native range. <laughs> <laughs> We should have we should have planned that for this year, Danielle. Right? You could have gone to the World Cup too. Darn it. Uh, Alexander has a question. Um, do you know what chemical the balsam woolly adelgid uses to disrupt the tree cell structure when they are feeding and when the attacks and when the attacks are killing the trees? Anybody? So Fred, is that what uh, uh, you and Frank looked at years ago? Well, uh, we looked at juva biome in, in, the, in the bark. Uh, you know, the insect only inserts its stylet in the bark. And the problem with looking at the chemistry in the bark is that it's, it, it's just, it was, a, it was overwhelming for the chemist to figure out what was going on. Uh, and so we never could really uh, come to any conclusions. We were, we were uh, attempting to find whether we could find juvabione in the bark or not. And it, the process of uh, teasing out all the chemistry just got too overwhelming and we gave up on the project. So we, we don't know, we don't, we don't have an answer to that question. Uh, the chemistry is complicated, but I think it's, it could be very interesting. Juva Bione, you, you know, George Purich and other Canadians thought it was important. And uh, we topically applied Juva Bione on BWA in Christmas tree plantations. 
you know, we found that those insects that had the topical application, they survived, but the production of eggs was either reduced or eliminated. So it had an impact on their ability to reproduce. But do they come in contact in nature? And we don't know the answer to that yet, nor much else about the chemistry. Um, I wanted to answer Gail's question is, is Balsam was fully adulted in Nevada yet? Garbage maybe? Um, we, I put, I installed permanent plots, long-term monitoring permanent pots, plots in southern, the southern sawtooths um, 10 years ago. So we'll go back there at the end of this, well, in August and, and look to see if they, um, we find them down in the southern sawtooths. Um, we've been mapping polygons in the southern sawtooths past four years um, and we really, Last year was a hard year. Um, it was a hard winter, so I think it was hard to find the woolly adelgids. Um, this year it looks to be much better. They much higher survival, I should say, for the adelgids, bad for the trees. But um, so we're, I think we'll, we should be able to, if they're there, see them pretty readily by um, late August when we go down there. And I'm going to be doing some white bark pine work in, in by the jar bridge, maybe. So we'll, uh, I'll be looking in Nevada, Gail. <coughs> And I was surveying the white fern in Great Basin National Park last week and did not find any BWA in the pockets that I was able to access. Well, I think that just about does it. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, please re reference that link in the chat window. Um, this webinar, like I said, was recorded, and it will be posted within the next few days to our website. Um, thank you, Steve, Fred, Danielle, Ryan, Laura. Um, we, I think, spanned a couple different time zones to bring this webinar to you all today, and it was a lot of fun, and I really appreciate it. And um, please take the quick poll before you leave, everybody. I um, appreciate it, and um, have a wonderful Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. You too. Thanks.